Um, so here we're going to be talking about uh, scaling Argo events for enterprise uh, from Intuit. So uh, go ahead, guys. Take it away. Thank you. Um, hello, ev hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Antonio, and uh, here's my uh, colleagues, Prima. Uh, today we, are, uh, we, are, we will talk about uh, how our work at uh, Intuit um, on scaling Argo events for our enterprise scheduling system. Um, so last year at uh, ArgoCon, uh, our colleagues actually present uh, how Intuit batch processing uh, platform uh, utilize Argo events to orchestrate uh, the interdependencies among different pipelines. Um, so when the, when, as an example, like in this, di in this diagram, uh, we have a deck of uh, uh, relationships among different pipelines, and when the pipelines complete, it sends events to, uh, to Argo events, and uh, the Argo events will notify the downstream pipeline uh, to begin executions. So in today's talk, we will go over, like, like as we, uh, we will go over the challenges uh, when we try to scale this platform up to like more than 10,000 pipelines, and we will uh, uh, dis uh, uh, briefly describe our work uh, in, um, in addressing those challenges um, uh, to support the scalability of our, of our platform. Uh, so here is the agenda for uh, today's talk. So I will give a little bit, bit more context about uh, how we, how uh, our platform utilizes Argo events, and then I will go through the different problems, uh, followed by uh, a brief description of, of our solutions, and then I will pass over to Prima to talk about uh, all the, the different optimizations that we did, uh, followed by a brief uh, demo, and, uh, and she will conclude with the impact of our work. So, um, so in our platform, uh, what we call BEPs, we ut uh, again, we ut utilize Argo events to orchestrate, orchestrate the different uh, dependencies among the pipelines. So as you know, the, uh, the Argo events include, contains the event source and the sensor, and both of them are communicated uh, through a uh, event bus. So in, uh, in our platforms, when, we when a customer or when a user defines pipelines, uh, we provide an SDK, uh, uh, we provide an SDK, and the SDK will actually translate the definition of the pipelines into uh, the definition of a sensor. Uh, if the, and usually the sensor will run in an HA mode, and so usually uh, that sensor will spin up uh, at least two, uh, two sensor parts. So as we scaled our, our platforms to uh, more than 10,000 pipelines, we start to see a few challenges. First, uh, back then when the versions of Argo events that we used st were still using uh, NetStream, and the NetStream uh, version does not have a persistent store. So whenever there is a need to change the definition of a sensor, uh, it, it, it will always res uh, uh, result in a, a restart of the port. And when the, when the port restarted, uh, we experience, experience uh, 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 data loss or state, or state loss. And because of the state loss, uh, we are not able to trigger the downstream pipelines. Also, the, uh, the sensor defini definitions and the, and the sensor uh, runtime specifications are coupled into a, a uh, one, sensor, one sensor specification. So when there is a change in the pipeline's requirements, we will have to modify uh, the sensor definitions. And because of that change, or be, because of the coupling, when we modify the, uh, the sensor definition, it will trigger uh, the, a restart of the sensor port. And again, when you trigger the resource center part, we experience state, uh, state loss and, and prevent the triggering of the downstream pipelines. Um, and another uh, challenges that we are facing uh, was um, the, in our organizations, there is actually a limit on the number of uh, parts available uh, within a, uh, a Kubernetes uh, cluster. So because of the limitations, we are only able to support, because of the limitations and, the, and the how uh, every uh, pipeline corresponds to one sensor specifications, we are only able to support like 1,800 uh, uh, pipelines well, within the cluster. And, and, and this also results in some uh, inefficient use of the uh, port resources because some pipelines are, are running more frequent than others, so that means some ports are actually uh, are much busier than others uh, while sitting there idle most of, most of the time. So to address these challenges, we make, uh, actually we extend Argo events in, in several ways. 
um, uh, first, we actually decoupled uh, the sensor uh, specification into two portions. One that we call a sensor definitions, or we call sensor metadata, which actually specify the dependencies and the triggers uh, of uh, uh, the original sensor. And the sensor runtimes will actually contain the, uh, the runtime specification. Um, um, also, we also have like a centralized deployment of the of the sensor, which which is like a sense a, a centralized pool of ports uh, to handle all the events. So this actually utilizes uh, uh, results in better resources utilizations because all the ports are actually uh, listening for events and processing events all the time. We uh, add a uh, external persistent store to uh, to hold the intermediate immediate, uh, state of the. Uh, of the sensor or the, or the triggers uh, definitions. Uh, so that, uh, so even in the, in, the, in the case where we have to restart the sensor port, uh, the states are kept in the external store so we, are pre we can prevent loss, loss of state. And finally, we actually add a Kafka implementation of the Argo UNS event bus, uh, which can support uh, higher, much higher TPS. So this is a very high level refined uh, architectures of our, uh, of our changes. Um, so again, we have a event source and we, have a, we still have a sensor port and the event source and sensor port communicate via, uh, through an event bus. Um, but within the sensor port, we, uh, we define two uh, components. One we call a condition handler. The other is con uh, we call a trigger handler. These two components also communicate asynchronously through another topics of the of the event bus, of, uh, of the Kafka event bus. Um, the condition handler basically res is responsible to handle uh, the, uh, the variations of different um, uh, uh, conditions of different triggers. When it, the conditions or triggers is matched, uh, you pass uh, the information to the trigger handler, and trigger handler will take over and will be responsible in firing the uh, actions to, uh, 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 to run the triggers. Uh, the sensor part has uh, uh, communications with a external persistent store, which, uh, uh, which is holding uh, the, the current intermediate state of every uh, trigger, uh, trigger, trigger evaluations. Um, so this highlights uh, the refined uh, uh, changes and shows how the current run, uh, the refined runtime will look like. So again, the pipelines, uh, we have like multiple pipelines. Uh, the definitions of pipelines, we still provide SDK to translate the definitions of pipelines into, uh, um, uh, into, uh, into Argo events. But instead of creating a sensor, uh, the, the new SDK actually creates uh, the sensor metadata, which is just a specifications of the, of the, of the definitions of the trigger. And then we have a centralized pool of uh, sensor parts, which is, which is um, uh, responsible in handling all the, uh, all the processing of the events. Um, so next, I'm going to pass over to uh, Prema. Uh, she will go over all the different optimizations that we, that we did. Thank you, Antonio. So. I hope we, we I hope we now have a good understanding of our design. So I'll now discuss two significant enhancements that we have done to achieve this high performance. Our objective was to have a high scale of 15,000 pipelines and approximately 25,000 dependencies. So this was our goal, and we were running towards that. So let me talk about the first optimization that we have done. So initially, we had one event source per pipeline. So let us say we have event source A and then event source B. Event source A has two eventing servers, server one and server two. And then the event source B has uh, eventing server one, which is gonna filter the events for the pipeline B. We had the filter at the event source level. So let's assume that we receive an event for the pipeline A, then the pipeline B event source, it's gonna ignore that event because that is not intended for pipeline B. And the eventing server two of pipeline A is gonna ignore that as well because it's still looking for the pipeline C. So the pipeline A event will pass through pipeline A event source via the eventing server one. And then meantime, let us also take a look at how the sensor spec would look like. So 
This is how the sensor spec currently looks like. So we have the trigger definition all over here. And then we have the condition as P1. So that is a dependency that it is dependent on. So the dependency definition would look like this. The name of the dependency, the name of the event source name, and the name of the event name. So going back to our presentation. Um, so whenever a sensor is created with that definition, the sensor will create a mapping between the event source name and the eventing server name, and in the value, we are going to have the entire dependencies. So let's now assume how a pipeline A event would work. It will pass through the event source and eventing server one. This is going to add other information to the event, which is the name of the event source and the name of the event eventing server. So when the sensor receives that event, it now knows through which event source and the eventing server it came through, and it it, it sees through this map and then gets back the dependency and then it processes it. So it all looks good now, but let's say we are going to have a 15,000 pipelines. Then we don't want to have a 15,000 event source paths, which is going to process all of that. Moreover, we were using the Kafka event source. So what we thought is maybe we can have a single event source, which we, which can process all of the events, and then we move the filter to the sensor. Now let's assume that all of the events are going to come through this event source, and all of the event is going to have the same event source name and the same event name, because all of them are coming through the same event source now. And the sensor, the mapping would look like the event source name underscore underscore the eventing server name. All of the dependencies now have the same key. So let's assume this event, we are passing 150 transactions per second, then per second for a single event, we need to process 25,000 dependencies. And if it is 150, ev 150 events per second, then per second we need to process 150 times the 25,000 dependencies. This were impacting our performance. So let's take this with an example. Let's, uh, let's assume that we have four different doors, D1, D2, and D3, D4. And we have the corresponding buildings, B1 to B4. And in the reception, we have a mapping between the door and the building. Let's say people entered, who entered through the door D1, they get uh, identified as D1, and they map to the corresponding building. And now we replaced all this door with a single door. Now all the people are passing through the one door. Now the, the mapping looks like, all, all the people who are coming through D1, they'll be mapped to all the buildings. They'll have to go to each building to identify whether they have any intention over there. Over there. It is such a tiring process. So what we thought is maybe instead of having the unique feature at the door level, maybe we should pull some unique identity from the person itself. So maybe at the door, whenever a person enters, we can get the name and give them a badge. And in the reception, we will also have a mapping between the name and the building. And now when a person enters through the door, he, he now has a badge. He can get to map to the right building. With a similar fashion, what we thought is maybe we can introduce a new identity to the to the dependency, so now our dependency would look like this. So in the dependency definition, we added a new field called identifier value. This is going to, in our example, this is going to have the name of our pipeline. So whenever we define the sensor metadata, now we are going to add the unique identity that we will be interested in. So the, now the mapping would look like event source name, eventing server name, plus the identity. And we also added the identifier path to the event source. So all the events that are coming through the event source will now have an identifier path. So that, that path helps us to pull the identity value from the event itself. And when the sensor now receives this event, it knows to which map it should look at and pulls the right dependency and it processes the right dependency. This were uh, giving us a performance benefit of 85%. And the other performance optimization that we did was, let's say we have a BPP users and they are doing some CRUD operations on their pipeline and it comes to our BPP platform and then BPP in the underlying layer, it creates a sensor metadata in the Kubernetes. So, in the existing architecture, all the metadata is tightly coupled with the sensor. So whenever there is a change in the metadata, the sensor pod used to get restarted and it always had the most recent updated value. But in our case, since we decouple the sensor metadata, at the runtime, we need to know what is the actual uh, metadata that exists at the runtime. So we thought maybe our sensor can pull those sensor metadata from the Kubernetes, but at 150 TPLs and 15,000 sensor metadata, we were facing more than 10 seconds delay to fetch the metadata from the Kubernetes. This was giving us a huge processing delay. 
So in order to address that, we thought to repurpose our sen sensor metadata controller. So it will watch for the events of the sensor metadata whenever it is created, updated, or deleted. We would persist the same in our RDS. And during the runtime, our sensor can now pull the latest metadata from our RDS, which gave us like less than five milliseconds we were able to get the updated metadata from our RDS. And let's go for a quick demo. I have already pre-recorded the demo. So this shows us that we have 15,000 pipelines, which corresponds to 15,000 sensor metadata definitions that we have. And then when I just go and query the database, and it shows we have 15,000 runtime instances that are in the pending state. And now, if we see the count of completed instances, it is zero right now. And our aim is to have 15,000 here and zero here, because after this performance test, we wanted to process all of these pipelines. So for this performance test, we took 20 sensor pods, just 20 sensor pods, and we thought to run our performance test. And this is a way to simulate the events for us. So we had a topic, and then the number of events is 25,000 events, and at 150 TPS. So this program simulates 25,000 events at 150 transactions per second. I'm going to fast forward that. So if we see, we have sent 25,000 events at 160 seconds. So immediately after sending all of these events, if we go back and query our database, we notice that 14,955 events pipelines have been processed. And we very, when we queried it again, we noticed all the 15,000 pipelines have been completed. All the events have been processed within just few seconds. And we processed all the 15,000 pipelines. And we, we made this with just 20 sensor pods. So this is huge. Uh, let me get back to my presentation. So when we talk about the impact, right now in BPP, we have 35,000 pipelines that are running in our production environment. If we haven't gone through this scaling mechanism, then we could have ended up with 70,000 pods in the production, which is huge for us to manage. And then we also notice that sometimes at low TPS, it's really the, the resources haven't been used efficiently. And we might also ended up managing the event bus cluster. With this new architecture, we, we noticed that with just 12 pods in our centralized cluster, we were able to accomplish 35,000 pipelines. And we also replaced the Kafka cluster with our intuitive event bus cluster because we already have a well-established and rela reliable Kafka cluster. So we provided an exotic option to connect to our intuitive cluster. So as a BPP batch processing platform, we were able to provide our users an isolation to do CRUD operations on their pipeline, though we have a centralized cluster, but the, it, it, is, it is way abstracted from the users and still they have isolation to control their pipelines. This is, a, this, this is an impact that we had after this change. And uh, soon to be uh, in our production, we are expecting more than 50,000 pipelines in which will end up with more than 60,000 dependencies. So this is our journey of scaling the Argo events. Thank you so much. So we have some time. Oh, sorry. So we have some time for some questions. So if anyone has a question, um, there's a mic up there. You can go ahead and uh, queue up over there and uh, ask some questions. Hi. Uh, so given the amount of workflows that you guys seem to be processing, did you ever run into situations where etcd was throttling or kind of backing off because it couldn't handle the load? And if so, how did you kind of handle those situations? Yeah, exactly. So when we wanted to pull the dependencies, I mean, when we wanted to pull the sensor metadata directly from the Kubernetes, we noticed that it tries to pull from the HCD and it was pretty slow. 
because the rate of operations on our pipeline were pretty low. We didn't face any issues while the pipeline is created or getting updated or deleted. But when we wanted to fetch the pipeline metadata, that is where we were facing issues. To address that, whenever a uh, pipeline is getting created or updated or deleted, we persisted that in our RDS. So we pulled that from RDS to overcome that. Okay. Any issues in particular when like adding so many pods potentially at one point to the cluster? Um, when we have, do you want to answer that? I don't know. Yeah. So when we have too many pods in the cluster, we, we followed the CIDR 18 mechanism. So that had the number of IP addresses per cluster limit. And as our Intuit Kubernetes system, they also have some wrappers utilizing some of the IPs. So we were, uh, we were in limit of using the number of pods because of the IP issues. That is one of the issues that we faced. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, uh, quick question on the sensor. So you guys said like uh, sensors are centralized. Are they decoupled and running in an independent cluster from the actual workload or is it like on the same clusters? Yeah, so they are, they are decoupled from the, from, the, uh, from, the work, from the actual workflow. So sensor is just a, just a uh, before it was a definitions of uh, the dependencies and the conditions for the triggers and what are the actions for the triggers. And uh, now the sensor is mainly just um, uh, the specifications of the uh, of how many pods, etc. The, the the specification of the runtime, so the and the and the definitions of the dependencies and the triggers uh, are are decoupled to into the the sensor metadata. Got it. So are they running in an independent infrastructure or like different cluster from the actual sensor and even source deployment itself? Um, the the controller is running on its own controller namespace. And the sensors pods are running in a in a separate namespace, but it's within the same cluster. All right, thank you so much. Cool. Any other questions? No. Once, twice. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.